Hey everybody, this is Luke Johnson from the Humanities Teaching App Noetic. Me and Bob Shutt are going to talk about Soren Kierkegaard's works of love today. I believe we are doing episode 16 of our continuing seminar discussion of it. And I am supposedly in charge of the content today, although I must confess, I found this section to be highly convoluting. I also found it to be profound on some level. And under the uh, duress of our time constraints, I was able to put together a lesson plan for us, but I think it's far from perfect. And hopefully, that's what Bob is there for, to help give clarity and insights where I may have erred. And I'm pretty sure I erred in many places here, but uh, together, I think we'll figure it out. What do you think, Bob? Yeah, it, I found this to be one of the most difficult sections to understand what he's trying to say here. Uh, of course, I think you and I both look at it the same way. We we kind of give Kierkegaard the credit and say he must he must be making sense. He must be right. So let's if we don't understand it, it must be our fault. Um, so we'll have to examine that and see where the blame lies here. If there is a blame, maybe just Kierkegaard is, is speaking at a higher level, and we'll kind of touch on those kinds of issues I think as we go through it so I have some questions that I think not not to put you on the spot but questions I think that will create discussion between us and maybe some insights on my own part to throw out there and see whether or not that helps make sense of this right well I think at the end we should ask ourselves we should judge how good a job Kierkegaard did and how good a job we did at trying to explicate him um, it may be crystal clear when we're done, so we'll see. Typically, I mean, what we like to do when we do these seminar things is we like to have it all figured out <laughs> in advance. But uh, sometimes um, you're given a really difficult piece of philosophy, and uh, you know you got to do it on the fly. So, and we can't be perfectionists about it because being uh, what the perfect is the enemy of the good. So, let's begin this section. It's called "Love Believes All Things and Yet Is Never Deceived." So if you aren't perplexed from the jump, um, you should come and join us and be a part of this because we could use your uh, your uh, Spock-like internet to help us, uh, or uh, Spock-like intellect to help us diagnose what's going on here with Kierkegaard. So he draws this section's title from 1 Corinthians 13.7, and he kind of creates some ellipses here uh, to essentially say, love believes all things. And um, I have a little summation, which I'm, I think is kind of right. So at least I started strong. Uh, <clears throat> amongst faith, hope, and love, Kierkegaard says love is the greatest. Now, why would we say, or why would he say, that love is the greatest? Well, love is the very ground of everything and will endure once the rest is abolished. Further, love perfects faith and hope. Okay, that sounded probably pretty good. You're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, I can get down with that. But, you know, I, I, that's, not, that's not really good enough for me. So I, I had to ask some questions. You know, so one second. Why is he saying that faith and hope are grounded in love and that love will endure beyond faith and hope? One could see that Faith and hope are made possible by the divine act of love and our reciprocation of it. However, faith and hope seem to be applicable only to this particular eschaton. If we were to move suddenly and dramatically into a new eschaton, such as the millennial reign of Christ, or if we were united in eternity with our Maker, would we need faith and hope anymore? If I may take some liberties, it seems like faith and hope will no longer be needed. We won't have faith and hope in Lord Jesus because we will be face to face with him. The expectancy is fulfilled. And I thought an interesting question here to ask, and I'll ask Bob this. Did Adam and Eve have hope and faith? I mean, I was not there, so I cannot say with certainty, but it stands to reason they were just with God in the garden. It also raises interesting questions about when did the church actually start? <laughs> was the church that present there in the garden? But um, that's what I have so far. And Bob, I want you got. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. You've got your head, headphones plugged in. Yes, right? I do. Okay. So 
maybe it's just latency in the in the Google Hangout. Yeah, sometimes that happens, and, that. and then it goes away. I heard that a little earlier, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah if I stumble over some of my words, it's because I'm hearing myself in my headphones. <laughs> so, so, what do you guys think? What do you think, Bob? What do you hope, hope and faith being abolished? Yeah. Because uh, we will be face to face with God in a new eschaton or in the hereafter. Yeah, he talks about knowledge also of that knowledge is uh, only necessary to bring us to a certain point. Uh, once it brings us to that point, it fades away. When the perfect has come, that which is imperfect shall fade away, is his conclusion there in, in Corinthians. And yes, I think that uh, if faith and hope exist, they'll be perfect. And so they'll kind of like maybe blend into, you know, be subsumed in the great river of love where we're in this relationship with God and faith and hope may still exist, but we won't know them as faith and hope because we'll know them more as love, more as existence. And I think that's the way I would kind of answer the question on Adam and Eve. Uh, did, they have, did they have faith and hope? They probably did, but they weren't known as that because they weren't needed as that. They were more there with love in this relationship with God. So they didn't, they, they weren't identified as faith and hope until they were needed. Uh, and, and that's just my own speculation. Yeah. Uh, that's just an answer to the question. Well, I think that makes sense, right? Like, when I don't see you for a week and we don't talk, I have faith that you will show up and be a part of this broadcast with me, right? right? And then I also... <laughs> Especially today, when the material is really hard, I have hope that you'll bail me out. <laughs> and likewise, on this side of the, right. of the mic. Yeah. So, but then when we're in it, right? When we're actually doing it, the it, the faith and hope become actual. They're not really there. Like it's there's no need for the faith. You showed up, and I and I don't know if I really need the hope so much because like you're already doing it. Yeah. So. I, I I mean I don't know if that would be analogous or disanalogous. I only need the faith and hope when I can't see you immediately. <laughs> and you know, right, right in the in the garden, God was walking with Adam. Yes, he was. Right? He's walking. Well, he, yeah, he's walking with Jehovah or Yahweh, a uh, a visible uh, manifestation of God. Correct. You know, that's that's a fascinating question because then we have to think about whether or not Eden was a physical place on earth or uh, what that physical manifestation of Jehovah must have been like but that's another topic for another mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. uh, you know it's yeah it, still, I've looked into it a little bit but we have so much other stuff you know to what talk uh, about. Luke I was wondering if maybe what I decided to do in my own studies on this was he takes this, he lifts this verse, uh, love believes all things, kind of out of context here. He just kind of throws this out for us. I'm wondering if we have a moment that I can kind of put it in the context of 1 Corinthians. Oh, okay? Because I think please, things please. might look a little clearer as we go through this, and you and I can probably discuss it more clearer. So I'll read through this uh, kind of quickly. Uh, so that I think, again, I try to put it in some kind of context so it's not like Kierkegaard trying to make a point out of some biblical text out of context. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I receive no benefit. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious. Love doesn't brag. It's not puffed up. It's not rude. It's not self-serving. And it's not easily angered or resentful. It's not glad about injustice and rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, 
hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But if there are prophecies, they will be set aside. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there are knowledge, it will be set aside. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when what is perfect comes, the partial will be set aside. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I set aside childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror indirectly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. And then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So that's the context that Paul gave us those sayings. So uh, well, we can, maybe I can reflect back on some of those pieces as we go through this and when we require it. No, I'm glad you read it. Yeah, it never gets old, no, does no, it? No, 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 it does not. <laughs> you hear something new, sometimes new every I, time you hear it. Yeah, you know, sometimes I, like, I'm like, oh, man, this, this verse again, I've heard it at a, at a million weddings. But, yeah, you know, still good, still good. So, so the, the next subsection that we're moving on to um. Yeah, I guess it's a kind of just a reiteration of what we said before called love believes all things and yet is never deceived. So, I mean, this is incredibly perplexing and I'm just going to roll with it. I mean, I mean, how does this make sense? How can, how can love believe all things and not be deceived? I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, it sounds like you're falling for everything. Doesn't, doesn't discernment require not believing in all things? And aren't we supposed to have discernment as Christians? What's going on here? What sorts of things does love believe? And why is it never deceived? Does love believe facts and yet is never deceived when those facts turn out to be fictions? How is that possible if love accepted in a loving man? Facts that were bold-faced lies or at the very least error. What is keeping love from being deceived is not the only way to prevent deception, to be skeptical of everything and everyone. Isn't mistrust the only protection from deception? So obviously this is very confusing, but this is so far how I'm seeing him develop the idea. Would you like to weigh in there, Bob, before I move on? Um, not yet. I think we probably all need to think about that a little while. <laughs> uh, yeah. Kind of let that simmer a little bit in our minds to think, of all the possibilities. It's something that we probably never thought before, uh, at least as, as uh, powerfully as he wants us to do, or at least one, as one-sided as he wants us to believe, that just love everything, love everybody, and believe everything people tell you, and you're going to be okay. We'll have to see whether or not we challenge him on this one. Yeah, I just asked about 10 questions, so I don't know if people are <laughs> going to have answers for all of those right away. I don't even know if I have answers <laughs> for them right now. Okay, so Kierkegaard tells us that simplicity believes everything that is said, and that vanity believes everything flattering said, and envy believes everything evil said, and mistrust believes nothing. He says this all on page 214 of my Harper Torch Books edition. So, none of these things are love as he understands it. If love is not believing the things that are said, like simplicity, vanity, and envy do, then what is the believes all things in the statement, love believes all things, referred to? I suppose we have an idea of what it does not refer to, which is some sibilance of... Uh, Progress. So, does love believe in knowledge in contradistinction to the aforementioned all things said? He seems to go on a long trail about how knowledge is constructed and how we can be led astray. That really shouldn't be too surprising given his judgments of worldly knowledge as approximations 
in the Philosophical Fragments and the concluding unscientific postscript, which we've discussed elsewhere. But I'll let this quote on page 215 do a little talking for him. And Kierkegaard writes, Precisely because existence will test you, test your love or whether there is love in you. For this very reason, with the help of the understanding, it presents you with truth and deception as two equal possibilities in contrast to each other. So that there must be a revelation of what is in you since you judge. That is, since in judging, you choose. So let me see if I can get my mind around this. In knowledge, we are presented with alternatives that are mere possibilities that have nothing to do with existence. Truth can be presented along with deception. Whatever we conceive truth to be in terms of objective knowledge. If we mistrust all the options, nihilism is our destination. So Kierkegaard is telling us that what really matters is the love that is within us. I'm understanding the problem with mistrust, but it is still not crystal clear how love figures into our knowledge claims and what we will to believe. I'm willing to keep pressing on. At this point, all I can see in Kierkegaard's account is that the lover chooses to trust an option rather than the nihilist. Love and mistrust are exposed to the same, air quotes, knowledge. They just differ in the conclusion to believe nothing and everything. And I guess I'm, this is my own little commentary. Presumably everything here means the, the learned expert's current conclusion about the alternative available. But he doesn't really say that. How am I doing so far, Bob? Should I keep pressing yeah, on or no, you want to interject something? Keep pressing on right now. I, I'm not ready to jump in yet. Oh, okay. So if all knowledge is in an equilibrium of possibility, the mistrustful person is terrified of making a mistake by believing too much in an advocate of a view or truth. However, we do not consider the evil of believing too little in people. We are on guard for being tricked. But again, we are told that the lover is worried about the error of believing too little in people and committing that error. So he believes all things. Okay. We understand the error that the lover is trying to avoid. But it is still quite opaque how the lover believes in all things and is protected from deception. Kierkegaard clarifies why it is so terrible to be mistrustful. On page 220, he says that he's on, on the, the, the nihilistic mis person who mistrusts is on the cusp of evil. He says, to believe nothing is right on the border where believing evil begins. The good is the object of faith, and therefore one who believes nothing begins to believe evil. To believe nothing is the beginning of evil, for it shows that one has no good in him, since faith is precisely the good in a man which does not come through great knowledge, nor need it be lacking because knowledge is meager. So, I guess what he's trying to say there is that if we don't choose to believe anything, we don't get to demonstrate our faith in people, which is a good. And so we become hollow from that possibility. We don't get to demonstrate any of that agopiastic love that is given to us. But what is love to believe when presented with all the possible alternatives? Can a lover really believe them all since they are all awaiting judgment in the realm of possibility? Possibly if we don't consider any judgments to be conclusions of the understanding. And he says on page 221, Instead of using its keenness to strengthen itself in believing nothing as mistrust does, Love uses its keenness to discover the same thing, that deception and truth both stretch just as far, and now concludes in the power of the faith, which it has to, ergo, I believe everything. Fine. So does that mean all knowledge claims are entertained equally? The earth may be flat, pear-shaped, a sphere, a snow globe, etc. Does a lover really believe these all at once? If so, is all knowledge reduced to a playful game for Kierkegaard that we hover above? Just like a book of literature that allows you to choose your own adventure every time you read it? The only way this would not be a deception 
if that one trillion understands that there is no epistemological out there-ness to refute the multiplicity of competing claims. But this feels like a type of nihilism as well. To believe everything equally seems to diminish all value. So how can Kierkegaard claim love believes all things, is not deceived, and does not fall into nihilism? How about I pause there and let Bob okay. talk? So what is Kierkegaard's epistemology here? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> oh, that should be pretty yeah, easy to answer. Kind of float past that one. So what does he consider to be true knowledge to be? Maybe not truth in a sense. That that's a little abstract, and he doesn't like to deal with abstraction, so I won't deal with it that way. But how, how do we know what is being told to us is true? So he says, don't evaluate it. Don't think about it. Just believe everything you're told. Well, uh, this isn't exactly how Jesus taught. Jesus taught us. I was jotting some notes down as it's coming to me. He says you have to be watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. That that oh, doesn't yes. sound like somebody who says, hey, just believe the wolves, whatever they tell you. Somehow, we come to a, a, an acknowledgement that there are wolves out there, and we're able to identify them. Go ahead, you were going to jump in? I was also going to say, Jesus said to be wise as serpent, but gentle yes, as doves. He did. Um, but what we have here... He's not here. We have Kierkegaard not really being explicit, and maybe he's not for a particular reason, or maybe he's not sure how to actually teach this lesson. I don't find a fault with what he's saying here exactly, uh, but I find he's kind of muddy a little bit here. It's not clear to me exactly how you. I mean, this is a beautiful. Uh, um, proverb okay if you're going to say love believes all things that's a beautiful proverb but how do you put that into practice I don't think Kierkegaard is giving us enough here to say how do you put it into practice because I could tell you that this is what the cults put into practice this is what salesmen <laughs> put into practice they, they tell you to believe just believe me I'm telling you the truth, believe me, I wouldn't lie to you, right? I'm here, I represent God, and this is, you need to believe these things and be, you know, and sign up with my little group, my little organization, just believe me, trust me. So th this is like giving a child a loaded gun and saying, oh, just believe everybody and what they tell you, if we take it at that superficial level. Uh, that's very dangerous, and I wouldn't recommend anybody does that to put their faith to the test. But I think what he's speaking about here, and, and again, this is only a thought loop, is that I think he's talking about perfect love, which involves, as we were saying, perfect faith, perfect, perfect hope, and perfect knowledge. So when we, when we love someone with perfect love, it does. It's not that we're loving the person in a vacuum, but we're actually loving God first. And we have this relationship with God that is so powerful, so strong, that we know God is never going to let us fall. And so we can freely love other people because we know God is never going to allow us to be deceived. But uh, our, our deception or lack of deception, is predicated on the idea that we love God first. He's not saying that here. Now, maybe he'll say it a little later. He's almost making this look like kind of humanism. Just trust in mankind. Trust everybody and it'll all work out. And I know he wasn't a humanist. So, I don't know. You, you read this all the way through this book, so I don't know whether he gives us a corrective later on down the road here or not. Um, but, but so far, that's how I would have to, to put it. Um, trying to look at some of my... Go, well, go ahead. Well, you know, something that I would add, I mean, you know, I, I'm still sort of mystified by a lot of what he's talking about here so far. But just to, you know, early on, you mentioned his epistemological commitments. And I think it would be good just to remind ourselves... How about this distinction between that Kierkegaard has between subjective and objective truth? It's been a while since we've uh, we've talked about these concepts, but they're really essential to his entire program. 
And and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but I mean, what we understand objective truth to be, you know, is there are many different flavors of this in regards to empiricism, historical narratives, um, uh, church doctrine, things of these nature. But from what I understand, I mean, those are all sort of paganized externalizations of what we believe to be the truth that can, are that could very much be an error. And the only really true truth is, is this is is this dynamic relationship that we have with God, which is subjective truth. That the that what is really epistemologically true is this dynamic reciprocal relationship that we have with God and and the process of acting it out through uh, humility and repentance and and um, meditation cl- and close study it, it, it is truer than all of that uh, objectively identified knowledge which seems to be cohere with the general structure of the Bible about how all of man's knowledge is vanity to God you know so I, I just wanted to interject there. I don't have all the answers to the other questions that you brought in there, but I think it is important for us just to pause and reintroduce subjective and objective truth. And, and you know, at the um, same time, not, at the same time, we also I think need to bring in his definition of love and the purpose of love. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it's the desire to bring one to God. It's kind of how he puts the Christian love. So it, it, maybe we have to take that into consideration that if we love a person in that sense, we want to bring them to God, we may want to believe in that person in the sense that we believe that we can do this, that this individual, even though, and this is he gets into this a little later or maybe he's into it already in the writing here, is that even though the individual is deceiving us, we are still to believe all things. So how this is the problem I have. How do we balance believing all things with knowing the person is deceiving us? And what he's telling us is that that is not being deceived. In other words, if I love the particular individual and I wanted to bring them to God and I know full well they're deceiving me, I would continue to love that individual because loving them and believing in them or believing them is going to uh, reveal the fact that they are trying to deceive me and I know it and I'm looking beyond that and past it not being bothered by it. So in other words, I'm given a higher knowledge, a higher understanding of what's going on in this relationship. That yes, they're trying to deceive me, but I'm rising above it by continuing to love that individual. Well, just to draw some distinctions, I don't think you're deceived if you know you're being deceived. Right? right? right. So, what the, so the question is, so if you're dealing with an individual who's like, hey, the earth is a pyramid, all right? And you're just, and and you and you know that's a bunch of snake oil, right? Mm-hmm. You know that's wrong. And you know you're being tricked and you know that you're being deceived. So what do you believe? What do you, do you believe that the earth is a pyramid or do you really believe in the possibility that in the endurance of the relationship and by loving them, you will eventually be able to win this deceiver for God. You're believing in them, not so much in their claim that the earth is a pyramid. Yeah, I, I, I think that if we look at love in the sense of wanting us to believe all things, has to be balanced with the other things that I read. Let me go back in my notes here to the first opening thing here. Um, okay, it says love is patient, love's kind, it's not envious, love doesn't brag, it's not puffed up, it's not rude, it's not self-serving, and it's not easily angered or resentful. It is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. See, I think we have to balance believes all things with rejoices in the truth. So that yet yeah, pure 
Pure love is not merely believing all things. It's believing all things as well as rejoicing in the truth. So we're trained to seek the truth. And believing all things is part of the process. We have to listen to other people. We have to kind of reserve judgment from other people to hear what everybody is saying. What do they have to say in order to to determine whether they actually are wolves or not. So I'm not sure that I would take it to the level that Kierkegaard is taking it to in saying that this is an absolute thing that we have to believe everybody and what they tell us. But rather, I think the desire to believe people is what's in love. Right. The desire, the one, I want right. to believe what you're telling me is true, but you can't get past the smell test theory, so to speak. Yeah, and that's a, that's a fun, like listening to people is a big deal. Like, so I guess the interesting question is if, if I'm just like, you know what? I've got an open mind. Tell me about this pyramid shaped earth you believe in. Right. And they go on and on. So, and they, they, they're like, well, well, you, you see the, the great pyramid of Giza is a small, uh, representation of what the actual shape of the earth is. And, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, which Bob does to me frequently before we uh, go live. He listens to a lot of my crazy ideas, and he's very nice. He's a very nice man about it all. And I can tell he doesn't believe a word I'm saying, but he's very nice about it. (laughs) But am I, if I'm, if I'm indulging a person in telling me that the, the, that the earth may be a pyramid, am I believing them? Am I believing that thing by listening to them? Yeah, that's where I, I thought he kind of does not leave room there. He's, I think he's a little too absolute here. I think this is a proverb and should be taken as a proverb, which means it's true in, in a certain case, in a certain way it's true. And it has a lot of truth and a lot of value to it. Uh, you know, there, there's an old one. That, there's another proverb to give you an idea. If you raise your children in the Lord, they will never flee from you. Well, that's not true. Not every case. If you raise children in the Lord, of course, you have a better chance of keeping the family together. But that doesn't mean that everybody is going to respond to that love and that family setting. There's still going to be kids who want to leave. Even in the Bible, there were. Uh, the prodigal son left home. So, you know, it's a proverb. It's something that we kind of say, most of the time these are true and these are good things to, to live our lives by. And I think that this can be taken as a proverb. But I don't think that we can put this into absolute practice without, without danger of either being, and I don't want to say deceived, but I would say uh, having a convoluted idea of the truth. I mean, how do, we, how do we resolve contradiction, Luke? If we believe all things, somebody says it's day out, and another person says it's night out. With believing all things, you can't resolve the contradiction. So it becomes physically, actually, impossible to believe all things. Hey, Bob, got a question for you. Yes. Monday, August 21st, 2017. Yes. At, at, at two in the afternoon, will it be night or day? I'll have to look out my window. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes night? What make, we're, a, a, in case it, it, we have a solar eclipse on, on yeah. Monday. So I was like, it, it, it's going to go dark during the day. Yeah. But, but if, yeah, <laughs> if somebody tells you two plus two is four and another person says two plus two is five, can you believe both people? I mean, there are certainly situations where you get into where you just can't believe one thing and it's well, contradictory. If they put you up, if they put you on the Orwellian rack and, and ratchet it up enough that you can, <laughs> yeah. you can see all the numbers at once, yeah, right? Yeah, you can believe whatever they want you to believe. Uh, but I'm sure that you get the point that I don't think that this can work in absolute practice 
I think it has to be taken in the proverbial sense, and I think that's how Paul means it. I think it's something that we should strive for, and we should let, in other words, we should let love do what it does. And love tries to push us towards believing all things. We also have to let truth do what it does. And we also have to let faith do what it does. We have all these these things alive in us and let the Holy Spirit do what it does we have to we have to be submissive to all these spirits and let them move and I think that's really what's behind what he's saying we have to be submissive to love and let it work itself out uh, that's that's the way I would look at this well if I if I may just kind of move on here and try to answer some of the questions that I raised at the last paragraph I read. Is yeah. that okay, Bob? Okay. Again, to understand how we are not deceived, Kierkegaard contrasts us with the mistrustful person who, in order to protect himself, believes nothing. He says, such a person may avoid being deceived by others, but ultimately he will deceive himself. Say, what? <laughs> He says on page 221 through 222, the Harper Torch Books edition, And yet, even if one is not deceived by others, I wonder whether he is not deceived anyway, most terribly deceived precisely by himself. By believing nothing at all, deceived out of the highest, out of the blessedness of devotedness, out of the blessedness. No, there is only one way to assure oneself against never being deceived, that is to believe all things in love. So, how does the person who believes all things demonstrate the blessedness of div- divine love? Is it because they know that all the knowledge claims are futile to begin with? Uh, it has something to do with that, possibly. And they have chosen to be involved with God rather than caught up in the hair splitting of worldly knowledge. So that the only way to not be deceived is to make the relationship with God the total priority. And I think this goes back to um, what Bob was saying earlier about there being sort of a higher knowledge because you've developed this higher relationship with God. And so you can't, no matter whatever the, whatever, no matter what the worldly lies are, you have the most blessed and beautiful relationship and you can't really be deceived out of that. All, all of this worldly knowledge is going to sort of fall away, Right. Is that kind of does that cohere with what you were saying earlier? Yeah, Bob? absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right in okay. line. I can I can deal with that. Okay. But what if one actively tries to deceive someone, but knowingly asserts by by knowingly asserting a, a false knowledge claim or data? The history of science is replete with such episodes. I mean, there's no brontosaurus. It, uh, that was a, a paleontological uh, fraud committed in the Bone Wars, right? No triceratops either. Uh, there have been countless frauds in trying to uh, develop the uh, ascendancy of man from monkey. Um, Kierkegaard says the true lover cannot be deceived for his uh, entirety is in the God relationship. Such a deceiver only deceives himself. This deceiver has deceived himself out of the most blessed and high relationship. So, I get that. I can buy that, right? Like, if someone tries to trick me, you know, they're trying to make a name for themselves in the world of paleontology by fashioning together the skull of one or one animal with the body of another animal and trying to pass it off as this, uh, as a brontosaurus. Or if they're trying to get me to believe that uh, Pitman... Uh, was an actual being and not a creation out of a pig tooth. Um, I get how ultimately the person has deceived themselves out of the highest and best relationship. And I like what Kierkegaard's trying to say here. Like, ultimately, when you try to deceive others, you've separated yourself from God. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, right? So, like, the trick is ultimately played on you. Ha ha. But what if we are talking about relationships and not impersonal knowledge? What if we are talking about whether to believe real people in our lives when they tell us that they love us or they care about us or whatever else. I mean, what one of us hasn't felt betrayed by the claim that someone has said, I'll never leave you, I'll always love you, or you are so beautiful and great and smart and awesome. 
What if a lover or a friend deceives us? Well, a deceiver may get us to love him and not return like with like, but the true lover was never concerned with reciprocity to begin with. I like this. I like this a lot. And the true lover being, you no, know, Kierkegaard needs to be a little bit more explicit about it, but the Christian lover is not looking to get paid back, right? In fact, this whole idea of reciprocity is a corrosive influence for the lover. So ultimately, again, the one who is truly dece- deceived is the one perpetuating the deception. Now, to worldly eyes, you know, the, the simple Christian who, who loves uh, without return or who believes and gets, gets tricked is going to be this foolish wretch because they weren't um, skeptical like everybody else. But in the end, they're the one who's really eternally and infinitely secured from the ultimate deception. So, from from the worldly perspective, the 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 believing Christian, whether it's it's in the trusted authorities of knowledge or in a simple relationship, may look from a secular perspective to be easy to fool, but ultimately they have access to perhaps the best and most secure knowledge. So, that is what I have prepared for today, and I'm happy to talk about any of the things that I just talked about. Um, you know, there was a, it was a pretty hefty chapter, so I had to, I'm sure I left out some important things. So, Bob, what do you, would you like to add anything to it? Uh, the only thing I was thinking about as you were, as you were reading your notes there uh, was that it it appears that at the end of this he kind of changes the 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 tempo a little bit not maybe not the tempo but the subject matter a little bit and he he puts it into more of the relationship than he does truth and and completely wide open idea he seems to be narrowing it down now a little bit more to the truth about a relationship uh whether he means to do that or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but here, when we have a relationship truth, we have a higher level, the way he's explaining it, that we have a higher level of truth. In other words, if I'm in a relationship with a person and they're deceiving me by telling me lies, they think they're deceiving me, but if I know they're deceiving me, then I'm not being deceived, is what he's saying in so many words. The fact that I'm not being deceived, and I know that, is a higher level of truth. Yeah. And I'm thinking that that's what he's trying to say here. I think he's a little awkward, but I'm not even sure that's what he's trying to say. I'm just trying to make sense out of out of everything he's putting together here. And that's kind of how I see it in these last few pages, that he's talking about truth really is a higher level. It's when you realize someone is deceiving you, and yet you kind of go along with it. Like he says, the parent uh, and the disobedient child, when the child thinks they're putting one over on mom and dad, and mom and dad kind of look at him and smile and say, yeah, you know, I know he thinks he's putting one over on us, but... Let's just go along with it, kind of a situation. You know, it's a, a situation is that you could be you could be um, deceived objectively, but you can't be tricked out of your subjective relationship. You can't be deceived from the subjectively true perspective. How about yes, that? That's good. But, uh, but he doesn't say that particularly, but that's how I would also understand what he's trying to get at here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, some, Bob, something I would like to do, because I did it off the cuff, and I want to make sure, because I, no, I, I don't want to be known as someone who spreads any sort of deception. I want to correct something that I said earlier. I said the pit-down man was, was, this, uh, was this, uh, this hoax. It is called the pilt-down man, and um, it was a paleoanthropological hoax. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't a pig's, it wasn't a pig's tooth. It was uh, fragments from an orangutan skull that were... Um, perpetuated as being some early species of man. Uh, 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 
a small detail, but I, you know, I want people to understand here that I, I care about the details. I, I don't want people to think that I say a pit down man and pig's tooth. It was pilt down man and orangutan skull. Guys, I, I don't. <laughs> Uh, for, the, for those potential uh, archaeologists out there, and uh, they yeah. might be concerned about that. Well, yeah. Well, people need to know about that. You know, what's interesting is the the the, the you know those uh, embryonic evolutionary embryonic uh, drawings, the hackle drawings, where they say all the embryos look the yeah. same at the early stages. Those were determined to be a fraud in 1997, and I learned those in high yeah. school. Uh, that was that's crazy. Well, anyhow, that's a topic for another day. But we uh, we just want to show instances of fraud in uh, in science, and we have to understand that science is a very messy process, and that we have to um, be aware of the possibility that we could be deceived by people who are gunning for research grants and things like that, just as we can be deceived in our romantic lives. But if we have this Christ centric truth. The subjectively true relationship, we cannot be deceived, and ultimately the trick is played on. Well that. said, my friend. Well said. That's exactly. I think the underlying truth that we can draw from this is that our love for God is the only way to protect us from truth. So it doesn't. You know, we don't have to worry about people deceiving us. You know, it might appear that we get deceived on occasion, but it's all part of the learning process. It's all part of us realizing that we are being deceived by mankind. And uh, so that's how it goes. No. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know what? I was like kind of worried that that wasn't going to turn out so great. But I actually think it turned out okay. You did a great job, my friend. Uh, and no, anybody... I'm not trying. I'm not trying to... Yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. But no, you did a good job. Yeah, kind of came to... Kind of came together. Yeah, and anybody who has... I just remind people if they have any questions about this... Even challenges, you know, you know, we're welcome to, to entertain challenges to just send us a text or an email or however way they want to get to us through uh, Noetic or through YouTube, however way we post this on. There are all sorts of ways to uh, to comment, okay? Yeah. And I'm interested in entertaining pyramidal structures of, of Earth. I mean, it does say that there are four corners of the Earth in the Bible, so... Don't I don't any of you out there advocating the the pyramid theory of Earth? I, I'm not trying to bash you. I'll listen. Okay. <laughs> Bob's just like shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to picture. Doesn't a pyramid have five corners? It does. It does. <laughs> it, 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 it it does. And and you know this is we don't. Uh, I, look, I'll ruin myself professionally by even talking about these things. But um, uh, you know what's interesting? There's passages in the Bible where it, Jesus talks about himself being the um, the cornerstone, the, the 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 cornerstone that the builders rejected, and the pyramid of Giza is missing its capstone. Yeah. So, so um, so 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 so. But I'll leave that mystery for other people to explore. Yes, please. <laughs> But you, you know the passage I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah I do. I do. He, he, yeah. he meant an arch okay. for those listeners, but, but he wasn't really referring to Geyser, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, well, did he? I'll, I'll have to ask you about that. Okay. All right. I might have off to chop on. this last part off. <laughs> All right. I'll okay. talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.